So in this chapter, we are going to be looking at the biosphere and human impacts on the biosphere. This is chapter 57 in the 12th edition of the book. And our objectives for section one, uh, which is titled the ecosystem effects of the sun, wind and water. Uh, here, your first objective is to describe changes in wind and current direction with latitude, uh, which would be on the globe, these uh, lines that run uh, north uh, north or south. Then describe uh, the Coriolis effect, which is a physics concept uh, on how uh, objects move on a rotating object. And then uh, number three, describe how temperatures change with altitude, altitude, height above sea level and latitude as you move from the equator uh, either north or south toward the poles. So what is the biosphere? The biosphere is a level above the ecosystems and here basically is all the living communities on Earth. So if you think about it as this highest level of organization uh, of life. Uh, so global patterns of life on Earth are going to be influenced by a couple of things. One uh, is the amount of solar radiation that reaches those different areas on the Earth. Obviously, it's really cold at the poles, and it's going to be the warmest at the equator. And then we're going to also consider pattern, uh, patterns of global atmospheric circulation. So how does the air circulate around the atmosphere? And that can also have an influence on ocean circulation, especially at the surface, uh, where uh, we get surface currents in the water. And so looking at solar radiation, the sun gives off light, it gives off uh, other kinds of uh, electromagnetic radiation, uh, including uh, ultraviolet and infrared. It also gives off uh, uh, higher levels of energy, which are, um, are very energetic and they're damaging to uh, living molecules, but our magnetic field protects us from those. The ultraviolet light, we're protected by our ozone. This is something we talked about in an earlier chapter, and that's found in the stratosphere, and it's basically uh, molecules of three oxygen atoms. So the Earth is going to receive sun, energy from the sun in the form of electromagnetic radiation, mostly visible light, ultraviolet, uh, infrared, and radio waves. Uh, most that, uh, that radiant energy, once it hits our atmosphere, it has to pass through that atmosphere. Um, and the wavelengths can change once they hit the atmosphere. The, the angle at which uh, uh, they come in changes. Uh, among other things, the uh, atmosphere also can absorb some of the energy from that radiant energy. So about half of that energy is going to be absorbed by the atmosphere. Uh, other energy would be absorbed by the hydrosphere, by the water and, and land and, and so on. So an important factor in how much energy is received on the planet's surface depends on where you're at on the Earth. The most direct sunlight is going to be coming from or around the, the equator. It depends on what season we're in and what atmosphere you're in. But generally, the most, uh, sun, the, the most intense sunlight is going to be um, between the, the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn and the equator. And so let's say that the sunlight, the sun is coming is over here. The most direct sunlight here is going to hit straight on around the equator. And as you move north or south on latitude, you're going to see that the, the sunlight is hitting the earth at an angle because of the curvature of the earth. And that means the same amount of energy that's reaching what would reach the equator when it reaches north or south, further north or south of the equator, it's going to hit at an angle. So that light energy gets spread out over a wider area, so it's less intense there. And this explains why it gets cooler as you move north or south of the equator. The angle that the, uh, the radiant energy and solar energy hits the Earth is called the angle of incidence, and that plays an important role on, uh, on climate and so on. Uh, and climate uh, is connected to what kind of life forms you see, uh, plant life and then animal life as well. So the Earth does orbit around the sun, uh, and it does so in a period that we refer to as a year, about 365 days. The Earth is also rotating on an axis, so it revolves around the sun and then rotates on an axis, and that gives us uh, these uh, day periods. Uh, every time the Earth rotates once, that we call that a day. There's a light and a dark phase. During the light, you're getting sun energy. As the earth spins and moves, the face moves away from the sun, you get less energy. So we go, we go through warming and cooling cycles uh, during that rotation. And then the earth itself is tilted. And so it depends on 
and where you're at. So let's say the sun is here and we reach the summer solstice, which is like June 21st or 2nd or something like that. And when you do, the sun is uh, going to, the, the earth has moved into a position with the sun in which the uh, angle of the axis puts the uh, sun coming directly at uh, the 30 degrees north latitude. Uh, and that would be summer, uh, that would be the first day of summer during on the northern hemisphere. As the earth begins to rotate, the angle stays in the same direction of the, earth, of the earth's tilt. As we come over here, we come into the autumn equinox, and this is where uh, neither hemisphere is uh, getting more direct sunlight. The sunlight is coming directly at the equator, right at zero degrees. So the equator is at zero degrees. And so that would be called the autumn or fall equinox. And then uh, as we move to the winter solstice, now the sun is directly hitting uh, 30 degrees south here. And uh, now it's the austral summer. Austral means southern hemisphere. Uh, and then we go to the vernal equinox, which is the spring, uh, when the Earth hits, the sunlight hits the equator more directly there. So this Earth's tilt and the rotation gives us the seasons in the northern and southern hemispheres. Uh, and season has an impact on climate, uh, seasonal climate, and uh, the kinds of organisms you find. Uh, in the area. Then we have global circulation patterns. Um, as you know, um, when things get heated, they expand because of the increase of uh, kinetic energies. The particles tend to expand more. The same is true of uh, 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 gases or like our atmospheric um, gases, the air in the atmosphere. It's going to, the air expands and that makes it less dense. So hot air will rise. And uh, the most heating is going to occur near the equator, so you're going to have uh, warm air rising. And then as it rises, it cools down. Uh, and then it becomes more dense and it'll fall back down again. But as it does, so it's going to con create these convection cells. And these convection cells are going to be uh, rotating on a vertical fashion. So let's say uh, that this is the ground here, surface here. And uh, let's say that this is our imaginary equator right here. The most intense light would be here, so uh, air would be rising here. And then as it moves upward, that air is going to either move uh, south or north. Okay. And as it's rising, it's cooling, so you're going to get rainfall. Okay. And that air now is drier. And so that air moves away, and then it becomes cooler and becomes more dense and begins to fall back down. And when it falls back down towards the ground, uh, say this happens at about 30 degrees latitude. You can see the cells here. You have to see the cells moving up uh, right here from the equator. Then they come back down about 30 degrees. So now we're at about, so this is zero degrees. This would be, could be 30 degrees north. The air comes back down and it's dry. And then it moves towards the equator to fill in the vacuum because as air is moving up, there's no air left behind. So there's a sort of a vacuum and that draws air towards uh, along the ground, so you're getting these currents that are spinning around, but that air is dry, and as it's moving uh, from 30 degrees this way, it's drier, so it's just sucking up moisture, and then you get these drier areas. So uh, this is why you see, you'll see greener areas in the middle, where you tend to have tropical rainforest, then you'll see areas where you have lower precipitation because the air is drier there, and it's taking water away rather than giving. Uh, so uh, these are important, and you can see these convection cells occur uh, approximately every 30 degrees or so along the uh, uh, latitude and uh, north latitude and south latitude. So those would be called convection cells. So uh, this slide does talk about that, uh, exactly what I mentioned earlier. Uh, warm air uh, is going to rise and move north and south from the equator. As it does, it's cooling down uh, and then it'll drop down. That's what descend means at about 30 degrees uh, latitude, both north and south. And then as that air falls down, remember it's drier, right? So as it's drier, uh, it'll take up moisture, and that's where you tend to see desert uh, around the 30 degree uh, latitudes or drier uh, types of uh, ecosystems there. Uh, and then, um, yeah, again, you see similar patterns at 60 degrees and then all the way up to the North Pole. So you have a repeat of these convection patterns there. And so... Um, this uh, diagram here is just showing um, uh, variation in seasonal temperatures with latitude, and that's going to be more related to that angle of incidence there, 
where you get more light around the equator and less light hitting there. So you get more, more surface warming towards the middle of the Earth. And as you move north or south, you get less. Uh, here we sort of be ignoring um, um, seasons. So these would be annual averages. So the mean uh, temperature would be in red. And then you get uh, this blue area here would be the variation. Right. So we talk about variation. What is the average range of temperatures that you see uh, within there? What you notice here and I have this, this question for you to think about critically here is this is zero degrees. This is moving 30 degrees north along the Earth. So remember the Earth here, you have zero degrees at the equator, then you have 30, then you have 60, and then you have 90, which is right at the North Pole, and so on. So we're talking about moving from zero to 30 to 60 and so on, uh, moving this way and then going this way is south in the south direction, going the other way. So you notice around zero degrees, you're going to have the warmest temperatures here, and then you get cooler as you move from uh, move away on both sides. My question is, why is there more variation in the northern hemisphere than there is in the southern hemisphere? You see how the variation is not as great, that uh, thick area here? And I want you to think about um, some things uh, to think about would be the amount of land mass you see in the northern and southern hemisphere. There's a difference and how much water uh, in terms of the oceans, the surface of the ocean you see in both hemispheres. Remember, water can absorb and release a lot of heat in moderate temperatures. So the answer is somewhat related to those two things. Uh, so we've already seen this uh, image several times. So uh, another interesting thing is that as these uh, air currents are moving, these uh, air as uh, it rises and moves, uh, up higher up in the atmosphere and then before it drops and when it comes back down along the surface it's moving along the surface it's going to create these typical wind currents and as these wind currents are moving they're moving on an earth that is basically spinning in a, this direction that i'm drawing right there right uh, so as it's spinning uh, along this direction if we're looking above from the north pole there it would be spinning uh, in a counterclockwise direction if we're looking straight down on the North Pole. Uh, so it would be going the opposite of the hands, right? And that's what causes is this, the, the Earth is spinning as the sun is right here. Eventually the east coast comes toward the sunlight and the sun rises in the east. And then as the Earth continues to spin, then the Earth sets in the, in the west, right? So it turns out that if we were to look at these latitude markings here, okay? And I look from above and I'm looking straight down. And then I imagine that I flatten the Earth looking from above. This would be your North Pole. This would be, which is at 90 degrees. This would be 60 degrees latitude. This would be uh, 30 degrees uh, north latitude. And then the, the outermost line here would be the equator at zero degrees latitude. If the Earth is spinning, and it is, okay, the Earth is rotating once every day, if you are around the equator, you're on the widest part of where that rotation is going. So you're moving at the fastest, what they would call tangential speed. If you're standing here, you're not going as fast. You're going slower uh, around in a circle. Uh, but at any given point, they call that the tangent speed. And then the further you go in, you're going even at even slower speed. And then if you're right in the middle where you're rotating, you're not going really uh, and you don't have any real linear speed. You're just rotating on an axis right there, right? So if you imagine here that if I were to throw an object towards the North Pole from here, just throw it super fast toward the North Pole, when I release it, I'm actually moving at any given point. I'm moving at a faster speed in this direction, whereas the object there in the North Pole is not moving at all. So when I throw something, it's moving with me on the surface, and that causes that object, it's moving with me as I throw it. Uh, it's moving at any given point in time. It's moving at this tangential velocity, right? Like if, if you spin or, uh, uh, an object on a string and you let it go, it doesn't keep spinning around in a circle. It takes off right when you let it, right when you let it go and it goes straight off away from that circle, right? So what happens here is you move this way. The, the, the object that you threw is actually moving... Uh, outward quite fast compared to as you move in more forward. So what happens is that object actually continues to move with you at that, that tangential speed. If you ever took physics at that along that vector and there tends to be a curving. So if you're moving northward from the equator, you're going to tend uh, to curve in the direction that the Earth uh, 
that uh, that uh, that the Earth has uh, caused it to be moving at. So it has to do with inertia, right? And so, um, of course, the direction that it's moving depends on what direction the Earth is spinning here, right? So, um, so what you end up getting here is in the northern hemisphere, uh, the winds are going to curve to the right, um, and in the southern hemisphere, uh, the winds would curve to the left. Uh, and so, again, this is caused by the Coriolis effect. As you can see here, that in the uh, this GIF image here, you can see that these uh, individuals are throwing a ball right to the middle, but because of the Coriolis effect, the ball is cur going along a curve path because they're more on the outside of the merry-go-round, and so they're going at a faster tangential speed than the middle of the merry-go-round is, so that causes the ball to uh, curve. Well, the winds will do the same thing. That's the essence of the Coriolis effect uh, overall, and that influences wind patterns, which influences moisture patterns, which influences weather patterns, and it influences climate, and then that influences life. That's the connection there. And so uh, moving on there, uh, there's different kinds of currents uh, that occur in the oceans, too. These are circulation patterns that occur in there. There are surface currents that are influenced by the wind. Uh, there is deep currents that are influenced by the temperature of the water uh, overall, but you're going to get these uh, gyres or these uh, circulating patterns of, of, uh, of uh, ocean currents. And if you have a surface current or a current that's moving uh, along the ocean and that water is coming from the equator, it's going to be warmer. Uh, so here you have, um, you can see along the the uh, the eastern side of North America here, uh, you're going to have this Gulf Stream, and that Gulf Stream, that wa that current comes up this way, and it's coming from the more southern near the equator, uh, so it's going to be a warm current. But if you look at the current moving along the west coast, so if you're out in the water in California or anywhere there, that water's coming from the north, and it's cooler because it's coming from the north, and uh, uh, when you're out there surfing, you're going to need a wetsuit because the water is much cooler and it would uh, uh, it rob you of your heat quite quickly. So uh, these circulation patterns within the ocean can influence um, life in the ocean. Uh, the life along the shoreline uh, can influence climate on land. Uh, okay, so uh, you tend to have milder uh, winters um, and uh, uh, milder summers over here. Uh, along the west coast because of the, partly related to these currents. Uh, so again, so the, the, these ocean currents are somewhat related to both the, the radiant energy being absorbed by the water as well as the wind currents right above at the surface. So ocean circulation is important in determining uh, uh, both uh, ocean and terrestrial types of climates and then what kind of life forms you see there. Uh, and then you have regional and local effects. So Regionally, uh, there's going to be differences uh, in a smaller area on climate. Uh, weather is a day-to-day -day thing and overall climate type situation here. Uh, so when we're talking about regional, we're talking about uh, identifying uh, different ter terrestrial ecosystems up on land. Uh, so those ecosystems are pieces of an overall biosphere, right? So you might have a desert ecosystem or a rainforest ecosystem. Uh, and there's an interesting uh, phenomenon when you have a mountain range. And if you have water blowing from the ocean along the surface, so let's say this is water coming along the Pacific Ocean, eventually it's going to run into the Rocky Mountains. And as it hits the mountains, it has no place to go but up because it's got to go it's trying to keep moving in the same direction. It's going to go move up the mountains. And as it does, it's going to rise. And as it rises, it's going to cool. And it came off the ocean carrying a lot of moisture that it got picked up, right? So as that air rises, it's going to rain on this side of the mountain here because the moisture condenses, rain falls. And that means once the air makes it over the mountainside, it's drier air. And as that air, the wet or the, those air currents move along the surface, there it just sucks up moisture, and you end up getting a desert on the other side. This phenomenon, where a mountain range uh, gets in the way of uh, of um, an air current moving along the surface, uh, where the 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 air rises and then it rains on one side of the mountain, and on the other side you end up with a desert, is called a rain shadow, and it's kind of like a sun shadow because you only get rain on one side and then on the other side there's a shadow from the rain. You don't get any rain on that other side. So you end up with uh, 
the deserts, like the deserts you have, the desert southwest uh, area. Uh, so this is uh, uh, called the rain shadow effect. Uh, so you have the windward side, and then the leeward side is where you get the rain shadow. And then there is a phenomenon called monsoons, uh, and these are seasonal shift shiftings in the wind. Uh, and so uh, you can get some monsoon rains um, during the summertime, for example. And this has to do with, again, seasonal shifts in winds and how the wind moves uh, relative from the ocean relative to the land here. So uh, in, in Asia, with the monsoons that occur there, you're going to have um, heating and cooling of the surface that's going to cause these shifts in wind patterns. So in one time of the year, you're going to have uh, a difference a difference in heating of the land and the water, and that's going to cause a, a shift in the direction that the wind comes. So in the summer, uh, for example, the wind is going to come off of the water from the ocean towards the land, and as it does, it's going to bring in a lot of moisture. Uh, and so here comes the, the monsoon rains. And then in winter, the opposite. You're going to have uh, air currents in the wind from the land off to the ocean. Uh, and that has to do with the, the difference in the way the water itself can absorb and uh, release lots of heat during uh, uh, different times of the year. Uh, so this goes back to um, the specific heat of water. It can absorb and release lots of, uh, lots of heat at one time. Uh, so, um, again, the monsoons and the rains that are usually associated with them have to do with uh, the difference in the season, uh, how much uh, sunlight is coming in and... Uh, what time of the year you're at. Elevation is also a big thing. It can have a similar effect to uh, latitude. So elevation would be altitude, how high you're up here, uh, how high you go above the surface of the earth or above sea level. And so we might refer to that as altitude or elevation here. And the, the thing about this is the higher you move away from the surface, the, the temperature is going to drop. And so uh, here, approximately, air, air temperature will drop about six degrees, about every thousand meters that you move up. Remember, a meter is a little over three feet, a little over a yard. Uh, and so as you move up, you're going to have a drop in temperature. So you're going to see a similar pattern, say, along a very high mountain range that you would as you move from the equator, latitude, right, not altitude, but latitude, as you move from the equator, as you move north. So as you move from the equator north, Around the equator, you're going to have tropical rainforests, and you're going to have temperate forests. Temperate forests are going to be like where you have real winters and summers, right? Uh, and then you're going to have taiga. So remember, these are going to be areas where if you have tree life, you're going to have a lot of rainfall to support that tree life. So the taiga is the boreal forest. These are sometimes referred to as the lungs of the planet. And there you have these conifers that grow all along a band, all along the um, around the northern hemisphere like this and then uh, um, so the that's uh, called taiga or the boreal forest they call them and then just above that as you're moving to subarctic region you're going to go into the taiga in the taiga there's not going to be enough rainfall remember it's more dry right as you move from one uh, one of those uh, every 30 uh, uh, degrees latitude uh, it's going to be drier so there's not enough rainfall the temperature also cooler, so you're going to get um, frozen ground, uh, which would hold uh, hold up some of the water in the soil. Uh, so that's called the taiga. And then you get to the polar region where you get these polar ice caps up here at the top. So if you do this and you move uh, in elevation, so we were talking about moving in, in um, latitude, right? So if you move up in altitude, You move up that mountain, you're going to see a similar situation. You have a forested area here. It could be similar to tropical where it's warmer. Then temperate forest, then taiga. You're going to have this line of trees that are similar to pine trees that you would see uh, in the boreal forest. Then you get to tundra, and then you get to the ice caps up there on the top of the, of the, um, of the mountain range. And then you got microclimates. So microclimates are going to be at a smaller level within a habitat. For example, uh, if you're in a forest and a tree falls down and there the canopy opens up, right? Where the opening is, more direct sunlight is going to come in there. You're going to expect to see higher temperatures and lower humidity in that area than if you moved into the more shaded areas where there's more tree life because uh, you have a full canopy of trees now. Uh, another example of microclimate might be under the log that fell down. Under the log, there's going to be less light. It's going to be cooler. 
There's going to be more humidity trapped underneath that uh, decayed log. So in section two, this covers earth and biomes, and the biome is a major type of ecosystem. And the ecosystems, uh, remember they include the communities, geotypical communities you find there, plus the uh, abiotic factors like rainfall and such. So you need to be able to define a biome, basic definition right there. And then to explain the primary factors to determine which type of biome is found in a particular area. So a biome is a major type of ecosystem on land, and each biome has characteristic appearance. It's defined largely by the set of regional climate conditions, how much rainfall, how much temperature. Uh, biomes are going to be named according to their vegetational structure. There are eight principal biomes and six other types of biomes that are identified here. So. Uh, here is the distribution of biomes uh, globally, terrestrial biomes, and um, they're color-coded there on the bottom. The white is the polar ice. This is um, going to be one of the six other types of biomes. Another one is a mountain range, uh, a mountain zone biome, which is in the dark blue. Um, and then um, warm, moist, evergreen forests, tropical monsoon forests, chaparral or chaparral and semi-desert are one, two, three, four, five, the six uh, other types of biomes. And then your major ones are the ones that I didn't check off. The tundra, uh, which is in the, the blue-gray there. And you have the taiga, which basically grows circumglobal uh, all along um, the area there, what we might say uh, might consider subarctic uh, region. And then you have temperate deciduous forests, like you see here in the eastern United States. Uh, temperate deciduous forest, deciduous, they're the ones that drop their leaves during winter, fall and winter. Then you have temperate evergreen uh, forests, and that'd be like the ones out on the, in the northwest uh, uh, United States there, like in Oregon and uh, Washington State, where you have uh, these really tall, giant um, uh, evergreen uh, conifers, like uh, redwoods, giant sequoia trees, some of the largest uh, uh, plants on the planet. Then you have your tropical rainforests, like the ones you see here in uh, uh, in South America and in the, in the green uh, area there. And then you have temperate grasslands. Uh, so temperate grasslands are, are going to have a uh, type of soil that's perfect for growing uh, crops. So this is the area where we, a lot of uh, ag uh, or crops are grown, corn, wheat, that kind of stuff. Then you have savannah. Savannah is like a, a sort of like a tropical type of grassland uh, in more in the tropical regions, warmer type grasslands. It's kind of like a grassland, sporadic trees and so on. Um, and um, then you have desert, of course, and so you'll see uh, the desert um, areas that are in this peach color right here, uh, like you see there in um, um, northern Africa, then you see over here in uh, the Middle East out here, and uh, out in Australia, and so you even have some of the desert southwest right in there. And so that's a map showing the distribution, and then here's a predictor of the kinds of biomes, at least for the eight major biomes, uh, so they don't have semi-desert, for example, or mountain. These are just the eight. And on this scale, you see this is mean annual temperature here, and it is possible to have cold deserts like the Gobi Desert in China is a cold desert. It's just what defines as a desert is low rainfall, uh, right? And then over here you have, on this axis, you have precipitation. So when you have a lot of precipitation and you're warm, you're going to have tropical rainforests. Then you have um, uh, savanna with less rainfall. Savannah's going to have more grassland with a uh, tree here and there. There's just not enough rainfall to support trees. To support forest life, you need... Uh, lots of rain, uh, rainfall there. So um, you can see here with low rainfall, the key for desert all right here is less less than uh, approximately 50 centimeters uh, precipitation per year. So this is mean annual. Uh, and then as you increase in uh, temperature and uh, rainfall, you'll have temperate grasslands. Uh, the uh, uh, but not too warm, right? So temperate regions be where you have uh, whoa, real winters and summers. Then you have temperate deciduous forests like we have out in the eastern United States. And then 
uh, temperate evergreen forests like you do out on the northwest uh, area there. Then the taiga here, you're going to have colder temperatures uh, here, so your mean annual temperatures uh, quite, quite cold uh, overall, but more rainfall to support tree life. The taiga is the boreal forest, and then you have the tundra where there's no tree life, not enough rainfall, and way too cold. The ground's often frozen uh, down in here, in this area right here. And so um, there is a connection between how much uh, plant life can produce. Remember, plants are primary producers, so we call that productivity. And it can be measured various ways. One way to measure it is to measure how much mass of plant materials out there. We call that biomass. Uh, and here you can see in the scale here on the, the y-axis, productivity is measured as grams per meter square. So if you took a meter square, uh, on the average meter square, a meter by a meter on the, on the, on the ground, and you measure how much vegetation was there, um, there's a relationship between that um, productivity, how much uh, mass is produced, their biomass they call it, and related to uh, precipitation in centimeters per year, how much rain you get. So you see there is a positive relationship. These are, represent scatter dots for different areas uh, globally. And then here's your best fit model line for that data. So what does this overall show? It shows a positive relationship between precipitation and productivity, uh, more uh, biomass produced by plants, primary productivity. And then uh, here you can see the connection between uh, the same uh, quantity, productivity in grams per meter squared per year, and temperature. So it also shows that if you increase in um, your mean annual temperatures, there seems to be a positive relationship in productivity as well perhaps because there is a connection between the temperature and the amount of uh, radiant energy that hits the earth, uh, right? So more sunlight, more ph photosynthesis. Uh, so looking at some of the major biomes, not all uh, 14 uh, that were seen in the global map there, but for tropical rainforests, again, the tropical areas, this is where you don't have any uh, cold winters. There's never, it's always warm. There's never going to be any days at all, ever. Uh, where you're like really cold. And here, the, the key here is the rainforest. You can have a lot of rain between 140 and 450 centimeters of rain per year on average, a meter, 100 centimeters a meter uh, per year. So these are very rich ecosystems, very rich in biodiversity, a great deal of primary productivity there, high temperature, high rainfall, and again, a lot of diversity. So uh, you can see the 1,200 species of butterflies uh, in a single square mile of uh, rainforest, tropical rainforest, as an example of how much diversity is. A lot of butterflies, there's probably a lot of plants and uh, other animals, right? And then savanna is kind of like a step below from where you get a, a forest life, right? So you're now in a grassland, but this is tro savanna is like tropical grasslands. And so here you have um, annual rainfall between 50 and 125 centimeters of rainfall per year. Compare that to the prior one. Uh, the low the low limit is 140, right, for rainforest, right? So then there's a gap. Uh, so these are tropical and subtropical grasslands. So uh, in our area, we're subtropical, so we might refer to some of the grass areas in our original habitat. When you move away from the river, historically, we had grasslands here, so they might they might be referred to as more savanna type. I refer to them when I'm describing habitats as savanna-like. This is a grassland. Um, again, these occur in a transition ecosystem between tropical rainforest and desert, where you're moving from a lot of rainfall to less rainfall, but not, not too little. So an example would be the Serengeti, uh, where you find uh, zebras, gazelles, uh, your lions, uh, think the Lion King movie, uh, that's what we're talking about there. And then deserts, this is something that we considered when you were looking at uh, uh, using that map simulation recently to measure, uh, to try to quantify vegetation. It's much easier with a desert habitat because the, the vegetation tends to be more sporadic, not very dense, so it's a good way to introduce to uh, using a line transect to go measure vegetation. But here the key is you're going to have very little rainfall, 25 to 40 centimeters of rainfall per year. It's very unpredictable. You can go long, long periods of time without rain and then just have a big rain event. Uh, maybe a monsoon comes in or something and you get a lot of rain of the desert flowers and blooms and then a long dry period again. Uh, so here, um, there has to be adaptations for the drier uh, habitat, storing water like in cactus. You have 
uh, some animals that are capable of uh, converting their water uh, to food with very efficient excretory organs so they don't lose too much water when they're getting rid of their waste. So remember we were talking earlier about these um, uh, convection cells, right, where uh, air rises up on the equator and then travels north and south. Uh, and as does, it uses its range to get you reinforced in the tropical area. And then the air cools, de uh, gets denser, and then drops about 30 degrees north and south latitude. And that's where you're going to find your typical desert uh, type because uh, it's going to be drier there. Uh, and if it's not desert, it's certainly not going to be forested area. Uh, another uh, plant, uh, situation that we might find deserts would be in those uh, regional areas where you get rain shadows on the other side of mountains, which we talked about in the prior section. Uh, and here, um, the vegetation is very sparse, like you see there, little or no vegetation. Uh, animals and plants are adapted to low water availability. And then we have our temperate grasslands. Remember, temperate grasslands are going to be where you tempers where you have uh, real winters, snow, days below freezing, and then you have summertime. Uh, and here, the soils are very uh, uh, thick, and the roots for the grass penetrate very deeply. These are perfect conditions for growing our agricultural crops like wheat, corn, sometimes you refer to this area like in the United States and the Midwest as a breadbasket. So a lot of these traditional grasslands have been converted for ag use uh, 100, uh, uh, quite a bit. So these would be areas where historically buffalo would migrate along the, the prairie just the way wildebeest migrate in the savannas, uh, you know, on, uh, like the Lion King, right? So. Um, so these, uh, the, again, a key here is you don't have enough rainfall to support uh, tree life, uh, a lot of tree life. So the, the, the next step down is grass, grass habitat. And then you have temperate forest and taiga. Don't have a picture of the taiga, but a taiga would just picture a bunch of uh, dense groupings of, of, uh, of conifers, the cone bearing trees. And they make this ring around uh, just below the, the taiga region. And so the, the taiga is found just north of uh, where you would find temperate uh, uh, rainforests. It's where you're transitioning from temperate type of climate to uh, subarctic, just before you get to arctic type. And so uh, what you see in the picture there is more of a temperate uh, forest. These are broadleaf forests. Uh, they shed their leaves in the fall. And there you can see the leaves are about to drop, but they lose their chlorophyll, and you have other kinds of pigments in there that last longer. I guess these beautiful colors there. Uh, these uh, types of forests were quite dominant, and uh, many of them have been cut down. Some of them are starting to grow back uh, with conservation efforts. Uh, so uh, the key here is you, you're going to have enough rainfall for tree life, right? But um, the overall, you're going to have some uh, cold winters, warm summers, and... Uh, so on and um, and then you have the taiga uh, and that taiga is going to be the area and it goes globally along the northern hemisphere uh, just a ring of uh, a stretch of uh, these evergreen uh, pine type trees and then above that you would have the tundra where there's no tree life it's kind of like almost waters tied up in uh, frozen ground uh, little or no tree life in this section, we're going to look at uh, freshwater habitats. And the first objective is to define a photic zone. And then the second one is to explain what causes spring and fall overturns in lakes. And then distinguish between eutrophic and oligotrophic lakes. So to start with, we're looking at fresh water. Fresh water is only going to cover 2% of the Earth's surface, most of the water surface. Uh, surface water is oceans, of course. Now, life does depend on oxygen availability for cell respiration, right? So um, the oxygen uh, um, per liter is only about 5% of that in the atmosphere. So yeah, proportion-wise, as far as uh, how much oxygen you find in the uh, atmosphere, it's about 21% oxygen. So only about 5% uh, per liter of water would be uh, oxygen, well-oxygenated water. So there's a lot less oxygen availability. There. And if you need oxygen, you're going to need an efficient way to extract it from the water. Uh, oxygen uh, can be added by photosynthesis for plants that are water, algae and plants that live in the water, and aeration from the atmosphere. So the, the where the water meets the atmosphere, oxygen right there, oxygen can enter the water from the surface. Um, it's not as easy as it sounds, though. 
oxygen will be removed by cell respiration that we see in animals. Even plants have cell respiration as well, even though they're uh, doing photosynthesis. Um, uh, detritivores uh, also require oxygen, and uh, any bacteria and fungi that are working to decay organic matter are also going to take up oxygen. Now, when it comes to how much oxygen water can hold, that decreases with temperature increase. So, uh, looking at um, uh, colligative properties in uh, chemistry, a higher temperature, less uh, gas can dissolve in there. So, uh, cooler water holds more oxygen. That statement is just saying it a different way. right? So, uh, when we look at the profile of a lake or a pond, um, the pond, the habitat is going to change with depth, and that's due to different uh, uh, physical and uh, conditions that are associated with what kinds of plant life you find there, how much light is available, is there, is the water shallow enough for rooted vegetation to occur, and so on. So uh, when you go further down the water column, and as you're going deeper underwater, uh, more and more light's going to be... Um, uh, removed or absorbed by the water and organisms that are within the water, photosynthesizers and so on. And eventually, uh, the water and everything else ends up absorbing all of that light energy and you end up getting to a point where there's no light. The area of the water where there is light is referred to as the photic zone. Photo means light. And uh, in this profile that I uh, borrowed off the internet, uh, there it is. So you can see this even from the shore all the way out to the middle of the water here. Uh, the shore area is called the littoral zone, littoral, and limnetic zone is the open water where you don't have shallow area uh, here. So this is the depth to which light can penetrate, and it is in this area where photosynthesis is possible. When you get into the aphotic, which means without light, and sometimes they call that profundal zone. Profundus means, uh, profundo means deep. This is the deep zone. Uh, and then along the bottom, and it could be shallow to deep, that's benthic. So you can have benthic all along there, but it's along the bottom. That's what benthic is. Uh, those are different zones out there. So um, the littoral zone is going to be shallow enough at the water's edge to where you can have uh, rooted uh, plants. So plants that have roots, right? So we're talking about vascular plants, like we learned earlier on. So all of this right here, that would be the literal zone. You can see the rooted plants in there. If you're going to have any photosynthesis out in the limnetic zone, the open water is going to be algae, things that are floating around uh, out there that are capable of photosynthesis. Again, in the aphotic zone, no light penetration for photosynthesis. This is an image given in your textbook. It's about the same. There are some differences here. They don't mention the profundal zone. They have a little key here that says as you go up, uh, in the water column, you're going to have an increase in productivity. In the aphotic zone, no productivity, and then you move further up, uh, and you're going to get more and more photosynthesis because you're going more and more to the surface where there's more and more light. Um, so make sure you study those different names of those different zones and what are those characteristics. Then we're going to have differences in temperature within large bodies of water like lakes and so on. And this difference is uh, referred to as... Um, Thermal stratification. The thermal energy is just the energy of moving particles. When they move faster on average, you have warmer temperatures. Now, remember, when things get warmer, they get less dense. The particles move away. But water's real funny because when water approaches freezing and you're going from, on a centigrade scale, from 100 boiling and you're going uh, to cooler and cooler temperature, water's going to become more and more dense. It becomes its densest at 4 degrees Celsius. Okay. Now, if water freezes, though, the water molecules move apart and join together uh, in a stable connection that forms this lattice where the water molecules are now further apart. So water is the only substance that becomes less dense when it becomes a solid. So at zero degrees, water will float on top. So the most dense, the densest water would be at four degrees, right? So when you have warm water and cool water, the warmer water would float to the top because it's less dense and cooler water goes to the bottom. Okay? Um, and so um, you, you can have, depending on the time of the year, you'll have different uh, temperature. Uh, in summer, you'd have warmer temperature on top and then it gets cooler as you go down there. So there would be this sort of uh, a transition as you're going from warmer to cooler. Now, this thermal stratification has an issue in that it can cut off oxygen supply 
in the bottom area, in the profundal area or lower around the benthic area. And it can get to the point where uh, any consumers of oxygen, if the uh, water is not turned there to you can replenish with oxygen, because in order to get oxygen down there, you have to have water that's been oxygenated to move down there and replace that water. You're going to get anoxic or anoxia, anoxic conditions. And there you're going to have water. Anoxia means no oxygen at all. And that can kill any uh, life forms that are living there on the bottom that require oxygen. So uh, hopefully you get that turnover uh, that would occur in fall and the spring. So they're called fall and spring overturns in uh, temperate regions where these lakes occur. Uh, and that will force, force some mixing. So there's this annual cycle of stratification. It's when the stratification occurs that the cooler water just stays down there and never mixes with the top and there the oxygen level start to drop. Right? And if we don't get too fall or spring where we get that overturn uh, and it's uh, too much oxygen has been lost, then you can have uh, some die-offs of, of organisms that are there on the bottom. So this diagram might clear it up a little bit more. Remember that uh, water is densest at 4 degrees, right? And so on the top one, there's uh, uh, in winter, there is a thermal stratification. Remember, water freezes at zero, and it's densest at four. So you have this thermal stratification here, and the water there on the bottom stays down there, the most dense water on the bottom there. Uh, and when it freezes, it goes to the top. Uh, during the spring overturn, uh, we're going to tend to get uh, a loss of the thermal climb or that change in temperature. There's a difference in temperature from, top to, uh, from the top to the bottom. You can see now... There's more of an even uh, uh, temperature, so that means the water is pretty much a similar density all the way through. And when you have wind whipping across here, let's say wind is coming uh, across this diagram from left to right, moving to the right. That's going to push water at the top to the right in this diagram or along that the surface of the direction of that um, uh, uh, pond or, or lake. And what happens is you move water away from the shore, that water has to be replaced by some water. Uh, you can't just let that water go and say, so what are you going to replace with? So where does that water come from? It comes from deeper up. So as the water moves away from the shore with the wind, the water from lower comes upward. And so you end up getting this cycling or overturn. And what that does is it takes oxygen from the top and takes it to the bottom and you replenish the oxygen. And then you get to summertime and you get uh, uh, another thermal climb with the warmest water on top and your coolest water, your densest water down here. And that water can stay down there and never mix with the top. So here, any organisms consuming oxygen, you use it up. Uh, and then you can end up, if this goes on too much, uh, you can end up getting uh, some die-offs of certain animals and, and uh, organisms that require oxygen. They call this area down here, uh, when you get the thermocline, the hypolimenon. Hypo means below. Then you have your thermocline where you have a transition from similar temperature. You have this rapid transition to lower temperature, your thermocline. A little bit of mixing there still. The mixing occurs in the hypolimenon, uh, and lim limino means fresh water, right? So, and then the epilimenon, epi means at the surface, like your epidermis or epithelial tissue is at the surface, right? Uh, and then we come to fall, and the thermocline is lost, and then you have similar temperature all the way through, just like you do in spring, and you get the fall overturn for the same reason described earlier. So you go through these different cycles, and this is a typical of... Uh, of lakes in more temperate regions. If you go to tropical regions, there's sort of this permanent thermocline. So you may have uh, a hypolimenon that's permanent with uh, no oxygen at all. So that point is made in the textbook readings. Now, um, in terms of uh, the nutrient status of the lake, plants are going to need certain nutrients to build these biomolecules needed like proteins and DNA. And so in order to do that, if you're a freshwater plant or algae, you're going to need nitrogen compounds and you're going to need phosphorus, right? So if you have very little of that, the lake would be referred to as oligotrophic and it makes it very, very hard for algae to grow within that lake. So these lakes tend to be very, very clear, just like the picture you see there in the diagram. Uh, and uh, water can penetrate very deeply, but there's just not enough nitrogen and phosphorus in the water to support growth of the algae, the, the stuff you would find in plant food, right? So they need that nitrogen and phosphorus. 
Uh, and uh, this is actually a normal cycle. If a lake is newly made from, uh, let's say, uh, some event occurs that just totally removes a big amount of ground, removes all the soil and everything, and all you have is bedrock below and it fills with water, it's going to be oligotrophic at first. And then little by little, things get washed in from the surrounding area and bring in nutrients and so on. So a lake goes from oligotrophic uh, to having more nutrients. Remember, oligotrophic is going to be very low nutrient content. Ultimately, you can get to a eutrophic lake, and a eutrophic lake is going to have lots of growth in there. You can see a lot of, like in this picture, you see a lot of algae uh, and so on. And so in a very natural cycle of lakes, the, the newly formed lakes get filled in eventually with soil and everything from the surrounding. They go through this process of eutrophication. Uh, so uh, here you're going to have a high density of plant and algae. Uh, there may be, uh, they may be low in dissolved oxygen in the summer uh, because of all of that growth in there. Blocking of sunlight causes death of plant material underneath. Uh, and then when that dies, it decays and that depletes oxygen from, uh, from the water. So that can be a challenge if you're a fish. Uh, and so light doesn't get all the way down to the bottom because you have this lots of algae. So this is a very eutrophic lake. There is a phenomenon uh, called cultural eutrophication, and that's due to human uh, activity. When we use lots of fertilizers in the yards to grow a lawn or in agriculture use, uh, that can create problems where those uh, fertilizers wash into these lakes and cause them to be uh, eutrophic uh, way too much, and uh, it's called cultural eutrophication. So in this section, we're going to look at marine habitats, and uh, the first objective is to know the different marine habitats, and then explain why El Nino events occur. Uh, and so when we look at oceans, they cover most of the surface of the Earth, 71% of the Earth's surface. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we have uh, regions called continental shelves. These are going to be near the coastline. Uh, the water's not uh, particularly deep. It's deep, but it's not deep, deep, right, compared to the open ocean. So the continental shelves can be approximately 80 kilometers wide and can range from 1 meter to 130 meters deep. Um, for comparison, uh, one time around a track, around a, a soccer or football field, would be 400 meters, right? So... Uh, it's not very deep uh, by ocean standards. Now, when you get out to the open ocean and you go off the continental shelf, so uh, if we're looking at this profile right here, a little cutaway into the ground, and we look at the profile of the ocean, uh, your continental shelf comes out to about right there. And so there's that shallow water up to 130 meters deep. After that, boom, it's a quick drop down. And when you get onto that open ocean, the average depth is between 4,000 and 5,000 meters deep. Now, a mile is 1,600 meters approximately. So more than, uh, you know, this is good. You're talking about more than two miles deep on average. And then some trenches can be many miles deep, uh, up to 11,000 meters deep there. So um, out in the open ocean, the primary producers are going to be phytoplankton. Plankton is just a general term for organisms that cannot swim uh, under their own, uh, significantly by their own power. So they're basically um, at the will of the currents. So they move around with ocean currents. So these, and phyto means plant. So these are photosynthesized algae uh, for the most part, is your primary producers. Like on land, you have land plants. So, um, so for the oceanic zone, when you get out into the ocean, uh, so uh, if you move from the shore, you come out here at the end of the continental shelf and you get out into the oceanic zone, you do have an area where you're going to have the most light, the photic zone, same as what we called it with the freshwater lakes. But most of the area out in the open ocean has very little productivity. It's almost like desert level productivity. Not because there's not water, but because there's relatively few nutrients for algae to thrive in. There's not a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus out there. So there's not a lot of primary productivity. Now, overall, if you add up all the productivity in all the oceans, it's a lot of productivity. But per square meter, it's more like a desert out there when it comes to how much uh, biomass is produced uh, through the growth of algae, phytoplankton. So uh, this does change, though. 
uh, when you look at a global map with this sort of imaging, and if you look at the oceans, you can see the outline of the continents and so on. But there's going to be areas where, because of currents, uh, surface currents uh, that are moving along the surface, uh, and along uh, also uh, due to winds, uh, currents that move along the shoreline are going to move away the surface water. So that surface water is moving away, and how does it get replaced? It gets replaced from the deeper water moving upward. Uh, and where deep water comes upward, we call those upwelling regions. And in areas where there's upwelling, uh, down on the bottom on the benthic, the ocean floor, and in that region there, benthic is just the bottom, just like in freshwater. And so down in the benthic area, that upwelling is bringing up all of this detritus and nutrients that have fallen from uh, other life that had once been uh, alive and has died and the material drops down to the bottom. So this brings up lots of nutrients and where there's upwellings, you're going to get lots of productivity. And uh, while you do see some yellow on the land area here, the open ocean that's in dark blue, that's going to be very low productivity. Uh, and then when you're in the green areas right around here along the continental shelves, you're going to have a medium level of productivity. There's, there's more nutrients there. But then you're going to see these little yellow areas like along South America. Avoid uh, looking at uh, uh, the land area there. But around here, you're going to have upwellings. Lots and lots of productivity there. So uh, we're talking uh, more than or as much as like rainforest type productivity. You'll see it around the southern Africa around here and in some parts along North America, Western North America there. Uh, you'll see these upwelling sites. Uh, so lots of nutrients coming up from the bottom. So looking at the continental shelves, the continental shelves are also referred to as the uh, neritic waters. Uh, Neris means to swim. Uh, so there you have a lot of swimming life like fish because there's a lot more productivity there. So along the green areas here would be uh, relatively shallower areas uh, along the ocean, the continental shelves that can extend up to 80 kilometers away from the shoreline. Um, and so they do have quite a bit of abundant nutrient availability, relatively high. So you're going to have uh, more productivity, more productivity, primary productivity means you're going to have more consumers. So you're going to have uh, small animals that eat the algae, then you're going to have larger animals that eat the smaller animals, and then small fish, and then larger fish eating the small fish. So you get this whole food chain uh, overall. So these neuritic waters are going to be where 99% uh, of ocean food supply comes from. So we'll talk about seafood. We're talking about taking food from these areas. In some cases, we are we have been overfishing in some of these areas here. This is also a place where uh, we tend to uh, go looking for offshore petroleum, uh, which is gasoline, oil uh, as well, which uh, is a pro and a con, right? We need energy, and hopefully we move to more alternative uh, fuels that are less uh, damaging to the environment. But at this point, we, we are where we're at in our energy economy. And so you go out there to the shelves where you uh, have these large oil rigs that will dig, uh, drill for, for oil. Most of that oil from uh, offshore comes from these continental shelf regions as well. So estuaries. Estuaries uh, is a general term for shelf ecosystems where we get fresh water mixing with uh, the ocean water. So... Where rivers empty into oceans, you're going to have that mixture and you end up with some estuary type uh, areas. The, out there at South Padre Island, where we, in our region, the uh, Laguna Madre, the bay that's between the island and the, and the, um, uh, the main coastline is considered estuary type. So uh, here there are some uh, uh, subtypes. The thing about estuaries is they do have a, a high level of productivity, and a lot of times they serve as nurseries for young fish uh, and other kinds of animal life uh, to grow within uh, some of the habitats that are available to them. Uh, so uh, some uh, uh, sub uh, uh, types or categories of estuaries include intertidal uh, type habitats. So these would be habitats between low and high tide. And some of the times uh, during low tide, the land is exposed. Uh, and then when the high tide comes up, it's uh, uh, inundated in water. Uh, then you have salt marshes, which are um, 
will be found in intertidal zones, and there you have marsh-type uh, vegetation. Uh, and uh, then you have mangrove swamps, and mangroves are more typical of uh, tropical regions. We have mangroves here uh, off uh, uh, on their coastal area. They're more tropical and subtropical, and because of climate change, we're starting to see more mangroves move a bit further north. Uh, we have a black mangrove here, and we're starting to see a red mangrove, which is found more uh, more southern uh, region. As you move further and further north in these uh, types of um, uh, swampy areas with mangroves, they get replaced with seagrasses uh, in those areas. Uh, so there's a change or a transition, uh, and it seems to be somewhat correlated to temperature, uh, type of temperature type in, in that area. Then you have banks and coral reefs, and banks is just a local shallow area on the shelves, and these are uh, serve as great fishing grounds. Remember, it's a lot of productivity on the on the continental shelves, uh, and these are great fishing grounds. There's a very famous one called the George's Bank or George Gorgeous Bank um, off of Massachusetts uh, in the Northeast, and uh, that one was very famous for uh, big commercial fishing and. They don't fish very much any, or there anymore because we overfished uh, the area and the fisheries have crashed. And that means that the populations of fish have dropped so much that uh, they haven't. It's so hard for them to recover, and they still are having trouble recovering. Then you have coral reefs. Coral reefs are also going to occur uh, in the continental shelves where they're shallow enough where corals can grow. Corals, remember, are animals related to jellyfish. They're in the phylum Nidaria. They have tentacles with stinging cells called nidocytes. And the corals often have a symbiotic relationship with uh, 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 photosynthetic algae, which gives some of the coral reefs their color. Uh, and um, uh, so these coral reefs provide structure for other uh, organisms uh, to live in there, including lots of fish. So these themselves are like the tropical rainforests of the ocean because of the great amount of biodiversity that you see. There are lots of different kinds of animals and uh, uh, plants growing in there. and uh, So they're very, very important uh, um, as far as uh, an ecosystem, a marine ecosystem. You know, we were talking about El Nino, and El Nino is a uh, weather phenomenon associated with ocean currents and ocean currents associated with wind currents. And so um, it's called the El Nino Southern Oscillation and there's an oscillation is when you have a back and forth. And so this uh, oscillation is uh, due to a back and forth of where warm water usually is located. So you typically have a mass of warm water off of the coast of Australia. Uh, and then during El Nino years, that warm water tends to move more towards South America, towards uh, northern South America, where Ecuador, Peru is uh, over there. And uh, this happens at irregular intervals between two and seven years. You'll have this El Nino event. Uh, and uh, the problem here is that the coastal waters uh, that are off of uh, South America become unusually warm, whereas they're usually cooler. The warm water from Australia has moved uh, uh, overall there. And this is due to uh, shifts in uh, in the winds that occur there, the trade winds that occur. Uh, they call them trade winds because they were used by sailors in the old days to, to sail their uh, vessels across the ocean. These trade winds weaken, and when they do, you're going to get a uh, change in the, in the surface currents there. And that's going to cause some shift in the, in the water there. So I got some diagrams that I borrowed from the... Um, uh, one of those weather organizations there to see on the right, and we'll look at them here. But it does have a, a pro, a, uh, an issue with uh, affects the ecosystems uh, that are along the continental shelves uh, that are there, and it can also affect weather patterns uh, in places far away from where this event is occurring here, including North America uh, and, and Australia as well. Uh, so, again, this is due to a uh, weakening trade winds. And what happens here is if we look at the top picture here, this is during normal years when you don't have the El Nino and you have uh, this walker circulation. So you have, you can see the warm air rises. Uh, and as it rises, right, it's going to drop the moisture rain, just like we saw in the tropics. And then that air moves uh, along uh, higher up in the atmosphere and then drops as it cools and then moves along the ocean's uh, current, a uh, surface. And that's going to pull water with it. The, the wind is moving along the ocean, and that pulls the water. So you can see those black arrows are, are 
causing that water to move. And as that water moves, it then is going to sink here. And as it sinks, it's going to, well, where's it going to go? Well, it's got, we have water being replaced over here. And how's it being replaced with the upwelling? Okay. So here's your upwelling coming from deeper, cooler water. And that upwelling is bringing these nutrients with it. So then you're going to have a great deal of productivity on the continental shelf there in South America. Because a lot of nutrients are available. Phytoplankton, you're going to grow great. You're going to have a lot of productivity. And then you have food for the rest of the food chain. Uh, and so this is during normal time. Then during El Nino, you're going to have a weakening of the trade winds. And so what that happens is, is the currents change a bit. So you can see now uh, you're going to have westerly winds now are dominating, and that's going to send water off the coast of Australia this way, which is normally warmer. You're going to have a weaker trade winds over here. You can see that the rains have shifted away, so Australia begins to experience drought during those years. And you're going to have less of this um vertical current that's occurring here uh, out in the ocean. So what you're going to have here is a weaker upwelling uh, over here. And overall, this is going to cause pattern, changes in pattern, uh, weather patterns uh, uh, in terrestrial habitats as well. But if you're getting less nutrients over here, that's going to be an issue because you're going to have less nutrients available for primary productivity, which means reduced food available for the rest of the food chain. Uh, and so these images are very important because all of this is talked about in your book with not very many pictures to show what's going on when we look at a profile of the ocean. Now remember, this represents, uh, all of this represents the Pacific Ocean, and this is Australia, and over here this is South America. This, it's called the Southern Oscillation because we're talking about southern waters, right? Um, and so uh, what are the effects of El Nino? Well, if you have that reduced upwelling, which is occurring over here, down to one twelfth, one twentieth of the normal levels of phytoplankton. Now, phytoplankton is the primary producers, right? So that's less food available. So what happens? Uh, there's less uh, food available for higher levels in the food chain. So fish begin to decline in numbers, right? And then animals depend on the fish, seabirds, sea lions. Their populations drop or crash. So you start to see die-offs of lots of birds because they're all starving because there's not enough food uh, for this. Then on land, you're going to see heavy rains uh, in some areas. You'll see droughts in other areas. So you can see out here, you'll see uh, drier, less rain out in this area here. You see warmer here in Australia, warmer over here, uh, parts of Asia. North America is going to be warmer. You're going to get uh, wetter and cooler, more rain out here, warmer out there in the, the northeast. Uh, over here, you can see uh, warmer and wetter uh, Peru uh, area. Uh, and so you'll see all these changes. These represent uh, warmer, drier. These are changes that occur uh, for that. So um, it has an effect, and these effects can affect terrestrial uh, ecosystems as well. Uh, so... More rains produce more seeds because more flowering plants are going to bloom. Land birds uh, may take advantage of the seed sources. Rodent populations increase because there's more seeds available, more food, uh, and so on. So uh, El Nino has those kinds of effects. Looking at uh, deep sea, um, when you go out to the deep sea, I've went and found this profile of the ocean here, and, and here you can see uh, this is the continental shelf uh, where it ends right here, and then you have that steep drop off that. So here's your continental shelf, and when you get out into the open ocean, they call this the pelagic uh, region out here in fresh water, the lakes, they call it limnetic. Here you can see the sunlight only penetrates so far. Some light, some, not all sunlight is going to penetrate. Some gets reflected off of there. Uh, some is going to make it down. Uh, quite a bit in the epipelagic. This is where you would have most of your photosynthesis. Better if you have more nutrients available. Remember, out in the open ocean, there's not a lot of nutrients. And then you start getting to a transition where most of the light is being blocked out or has been absorbed by other organisms or the water itself. So you're getting into the twilight region. It's called meso uh, and bathypelagic. And then you get into the abyss or the abyssal zone or the abyssal pelagic. And there, there's no light. Uh, and then you get into the hadal zones, which hadal is like Hades, hell. Uh, and here you're talking about deep ocean trenches. And in some of these areas, you manage to find life forms uh, out there. So uh, the, the, the key thing about looking at deep sea, when we're talking about deep sea, we're talking about getting into the uh, 
a visopelagic out here. Uh, so you're talking about uh, seasonless. The water temperature is always uh, fairly low around its densest uh, temperature, which is four degrees Celsius. There's a lot of water above you. It weighs a lot. So there's a lot of pressure, 400 to 500 atmospheres. That's 400 to 500 times the normal pressure that we experience uh, from air at sea level. That's a lot of pressure. Um, here, food originates from the top sunlit area. It could be animals like a whale dying or fish dying or plankton just dying and falling and dropping down here. As that food drops, it's picked up by other animals, filter feeders and so on. Uh, but some eventually can make it uh, uh, down to certain areas. Not all of it does. Few does. 99% uh, of it uh, gets picked up by other organisms before it gets to the bottom. Uh, any animals you see in these deep, deep areas are going to be small-bodied and uh, not very dense in population, so when you say thinly distributed. And then you have some hydrothermal events, which will occur in areas that are in deep water, and so they show uh, some organisms that might be down here in a trench region where there might be a break uh, in the ocean surface or in some other crack in, uh, in oceanic uh, plates. The oceanic plates are deeper underwater rather than the continental plates. And those plates are going to be areas where warm water cracks and warm water might come up with lots of minerals, uh, specifically uh, sulfur-containing minerals. And so you have bacteria that support a whole ecosystem under their uh, food chain. And so these are hydrothermal vent communities. It's thick with life means just lots of life down there, a good density of uh, organisms, um, the producers, though, are not going to be photosynthesizers. They're going to be uh, chemoautotrophic. Uh, these would be bacteria that can oxidize sulfur uh, and obtain energetic electrons from, uh, from there to drive their energy needs uh, and build biomolecules. And then these bacteria then are filtered out by tube worms, like the ones you see here, and other kinds of animals can be found uh, within those regions. Water temperature coming up out of those uh, vents can be up as up to 350 degrees Celsius. Though the water's not going to boil because of so much pressure down there. The water's just extra hot. It's like a pressure cooker. You can get water to a much higher temperature. You're under lots of pressure there. So in this section, we're going to be looking at the impacts uh, human activity has on the biosphere. And in this particular section, we're going to look at pollution and resource depletion. Resources are things that we use. Uh, wood from trees, water, and so on. And depleting just means we're using them faster than they can naturally uh, replace themselves. And that depends on whether it's a renewable resource or not. But we won't go over every possible uh, resource, just some. And so your objectives include to name a major, uh, name majors, name some. I would be able to also, I would suggest that you can briefly describe them, not just list them, but major threats to ecosystems uh, due to human uh, activity. Differentiate between point source and diffuse pollution. And then explain the effect of deforestation. What does that happen when you kill too many trees in a forest? And then describe habitat fragmentation, how it can lead to increased incidence of human diseases. When you go and you cut up uh, into pieces uh, a habitat like a forest. So uh, humans do have quite a big footprint on the planet overall. There's over 7.3 billion uh, people on this planet and we all need uh, to consume resources. We generate waste. Uh, to satisfy our basic needs, and in well-developed countries, our wants, which is beyond uh, basic things we need for uh, living a healthy life. Uh, so these activities can have adverse effects on ecosystems. Uh, an example is the use of DDT, which is short for a long name of a pesticide compound used uh, to help uh, kill off mosquitoes. This was used quite a bit after World War II, so, you know, the 1940s. Uh, the thing about DDT is that it lasts a long time in the environment. It has a half-life. You talk about doubling time, half-life is kind of the opposite. Not how much time it takes to double population, but a half-life is for compounds and how long it takes uh, for half of that to degrade. And the half-life for DDT is about 20 years. So if you have... Uh, 100 pounds of DDT in the environment, it would take 20 years to bring it down to 50 pounds, right? And the thing about this is that 
DDT can accumulate in food chains because it is oil. It says oil soluble, but a lot of times you'll hear uh, in environmental and toxicology circles they call it fat soluble, which means it dissolves in nonpolar, and that means an animal can hold it uh, within their fat, their fat stored when they consume this. And the thing about this is that uh, the DDT moves up the food chain, and as it moves up, it biomagnifies in the food chain. Now, there were some results that uh, were con connections were made to uh, large birds like ospreys, which uh, eat fish, bald eagles are also fish eaters, and other raptors. These are raptors with the sharp talons. Pelicans are also consumers of fish. And it was found that these birds uh, were uh, having reduced reproductive success when the parents sort of incubate the eggs and uh, was when they lay on the egg to keep it warm. The eggs uh, shells were too thin and would collapse, and so the, the embryo would die. And so populations were dropping, and the connection was made that uh, the DDT was accumulated in the fat in these birds, and they used that fat during the reproductive season to build eggs. So when you mobilize the fat and use that fat to transfer to the egg, you're freeing up and getting that DDT to circulate around. And one of the effects on the physiology of the bird was that the females were not able to lay a good enough uh, shell coat. So a connection was made there. And so we started to see populations of peregrine falcons and these other raptors decline. And that's a big problem because raptors are an important part of balance in the ecosystem. But you can see how this works here. Uh, if you get DDT out in the environment, it's going to be uh, very low levels, parts per million in the water. Then that gets taken up by small animals called zooplankton. That's different than phytoplankton. They float around, they move with the currents, but they're not producers, they're consumers. Then small fish eat them, and as they eat them, small fish have to eat a lot of phytoplankton. So the small fish start to accumulate an increase uh, in parts per million in terms of their tissues now, right? Remember, we started at a very, very small number, 0 0.0000003 parts per million, and now by the time you get to the small fish, it's amplifying, magnifying. Then larger fish have to eat a lot of smaller fish, and now you can find two parts per million within their tissues. And then the top predators have to eat a lot of large fish, and now they've accumulated this pesticide to 25 parts per million. Uh, DDT is still used in different parts of the world, and we probably actually have a small amount of DDT stored uh, in our fat. Small, not enough to hurt us health-wise, but... Uh, it's still there, it's still in the environment, and it's still used. It's been banned here, but it's still used in other parts of the world. Um, so, uh, looking at pollution is another big problem, pollution in freshwater. Freshwater habitats uh, are threatened by pollution um, and resource use. So, using uh, freshwater, using too much freshwater is causing the loss of uh, lakes, ponds, wetlands, and fresh water for drinking. Uh, and so that's overuse uh, of it beyond its ability to uh, replenish itself. Uh, and then we also have pollution of these freshwater sources. And some are point source. And a point source for pollution is going to be something that you can easily identify, like a factory. A factory might be releasing waste out of a pipe and it enters uh, a stream. Uh, sewage treatment plants can be sources of pollution. Depends on the level of treatment. There's primary, secondary, and tertiary is the ultimate one. It's very expensive, though, for a city to invest that kind of money. But if you treat it to just secondary, you're still going to be releasing phosphates and nitrogen into the water, and that's going to cause eutrophication. So it creates a problem with eutrophication we discussed earlier. Um, and so... The thing about point solution is they're very easy to identify and it's very easy to look at regulations. So here we talk about passing laws that regulate what you can release into this water to help reduce uh, negative impacts. <laughs> and then you have diffuse pollution, and this one is not easily identified. This is going to be the source of pollution is more widespread. You couldn't stop it at any one point. Uh, and so a great example of this would be that cultural eutrophication I mentioned earlier. Uh, and here, this is from runoff from a broader area, and that's going to bring in nitrates and phosphates, which is plant food. And in water, when it gets to water, that causes algae to bloom excessively. And so what um, we, what I'm looking at here that's highlighted in green 
is the location of farms and in red is cities. But this is all the Midwest and a lot of these streams here kind of combine here into the Mississippi Basin where uh, water uh, comes together from different streams to drain into this larger Mississippi River. And so what's happening here, and there's a lot of agriculture in that area, and lawns, people's lawns, and uh, this fertilizer that the crop doesn't pick up uh, and use to build plant tissue ends up washing uh, downstream. Now farmers are real good at using as much as they need, uh, and maybe a bigger culprit would be lawns, but with such wide expanses of, of farmland, Per meter, you're still getting quite a bit of it, uh, and so all of that ends up running off here, and you end up causing cultural eutrophication, lots of nutrients out here in the Gulf of Mexico, and that can create problems called dead zones. And the dead zone here is when the algae blooms, it blooms and grows so rapidly uh, that it basically chokes itself off of sunlight, and so algae stuck in deeper in the water column ends up dying. And when you have dead cells, then you have bacteria taking over, breaking down and decomposing, and that uses up oxygen. So initially, the producer probably producing extra oxygen, but now you have a loss of oxygen. And that causes hypoxia, anoxia, hypo means less than normal. And that can cause massive die-offs of animals that live on the ocean, on the floor, uh, the continental shelf floor there. Uh, invertebrates and fish and so on. So you can have these massive die-offs. So that affects the entire ecosystem there. That's negative, right? So uh, this eutrophication can originate from lawns, farms, golf courses, and so on. Now, the solution to this is going to depend on educating the public uh, and uh, some political action overall. Uh, again, it's harder uh, to to uh, try to prevent this when it's not a point source, right? But it's possible through, uh, um, if you're going to be using fertilizers, use them uh, in ways that reduce runoff, right? So, uh, and now we have another uh, issue. This is another one on the list, acid precipitation. And mercury sometimes is associated with acid precipitation. Now, where does acid precipitation come from? It comes from combustion of fossil fuels. Um, when you burn uh, just uh, in an internal combustion engine, that can create, uh, it can be at such a high temperature. And this is not on your list here on the slide, so I'm just giving you a little bit extra here. There's nitrogen in the atmosphere, and it's such a high temperature that causes nitrogen. Uh, molecular nitrogen to actually react with, because such a high temperature, to react with oxygen. And then that produces nitrogen oxides. We call them NOxes. Uh, and uh, so this could be NO3 and so on. And the, the NOxes react with water and form nitric acid. The same thing for sulfur. Sulfur react, uh, that's found in coal. So sulfur is a part of coal. And so sulfur uh, during that combustion, the sulfur itself can react at a high temperature with oxygen, producing sulfur oxide. And these are gases. We can call them noxes and soxes. And the sulfur oxides react with water and produce sulfuric acid, right? So, uh, uh, and that one's listed here. So the noxes produce nitric acid, nitrous acid. And what does that do? That reduces the pH of rainwater because it goes up to the atmosphere and then combines with the water vapor up there. And now we have acid uh, when precipitation falls. So now you have lower than normal pH of rain. Uh, and so that can cause issues on plant life, which we'll mention in a bit. Another thing that you find in coal is mercury. And so mercury can be emitted uh, from the smokestack uh, and released into the environment. And so... Mercury is very toxic to uh, animals. It causes problems with the nervous system. It's uh, uh, it's one of those heavy metals you don't want to get in your system at any level, just like lead. Uh, very toxic to your nervous system and other organs as well. So uh, mercury can interfere with brain development in human babies uh, before and after birth as an example. Uh, and so... What happens here is uh, the pH drops for, for normal rainwater. Uh, and um, that itself can cause metals to uh, leach out of minerals that are found in soil that wouldn't normally. And leach out means to mobilize, to get them to move, to dissolve with the water because of the lower pH. So you end up with heavy metals that are found in minerals that they're pretty locked into the minerals and don't normally enter food chains. They end up uh, dissolving in the acid in the more acidic water 
and that, that can cause them uh, mer things like mercury to move out of soil and uh, so not just from the coal but from the soil there and then get into water and then fish pick up the, mer the mercury get it into their system and then it moves into the food chain and into humans who might consume them uh, right so uh, these are our issues here so a pH below 5 uh, fish and other aquatic animals are going to die or unable to reproduce so we can change the pH of the water uh, itself where the fish are living in it might be a, a freshwater pond or lake uh, also mercury can accumulate in fish so especially uh, predatory fish fish that eat smaller fish they're going to magnify biomagnify within their tissues uh, in fact uh, it's actually recommended for women who are expecting or pregnant uh, to not eat things like tuna and other top predator fish because they tend they, they, they tend to have high concentrate relatively high concentration of mercury in their tissues. Uh, so uh, things are not as they used to be where uh, uh, things were uh, are a little less safe to eat now because of that. So you can see here, here's a map that shows some of the uh, pH levels of, as, of rain as it falls. And you can see here in the white areas, the pH is greater than 5.3. Remember, pH of 7 is neutral. Rain tends to be slightly acidic just because of the carbon dioxide can uh, dissolve with the water as well and create a weak acid called carbonic acid. But what you have out here in the Midwest is a lot of coal fire plants. And when they release their uh, the smoke into the atmosphere on these high smokestacks, then you have winds going this way, carrying that uh, so sulfur oxides uh, towards this area over here. And then you end up with acid rain over here. And then you can see the effects of acid rain uh, on the forest here. That's going to cause important minerals and nutrients and possibly some heavy metals I mentioned earlier. But uh, more importantly, important nutrients from the soil to leach out and move away from the plants that need these uh, nutrients. And that causes die-offs of these trees. And so you get loss of forest because of the acid rain. So um, that was a kind of pollution uh, uh, created by uh, burning uh, fossil fuels that create uh, acid rain. Uh, now you have um, uh, terrestrial ecosystems that can be threatened by deforestation. And so you can see here slash and burn uh, is one method of clearing out large amounts of forest area. And when you do that, you're removing all of that plant life. And what ends up happening here, and sometimes it's in rainforest, you're still getting some rain for a time. The plant life itself is responsible for the rain. But when you do get rains, there's no vegetation there to stabilize the soil. So you get a lot of runoff of soil and it goes off into the, into the water. So there goes lots of nutrients and just uh, sediments that block out light and that creates all kinds of death in the uh, aquatic ecosystem and then you lose any fertile soil which wasn't much in a, in a rainforest you didn't even have much uh, fertile soil it's not very deep you lose whatever soil you had left in about five years uh, because of this issue uh, so this is a uh, it's become a big problem in, in parts where there are these significant uh, amounts of area of, of uh, forest uh, so, um, clearing out forests 100% completely from areas is just not a good idea. Uh, so, what are the effects of deforestation? I probably mentioned some, but let's think about others. Uh, in forests, you have a great diversity of, of plant life, especially in rainforests, but in other forests too. Other forests have been cleared out, not just rainforest, temperate deciduous forests as well. And so on. But what you end up doing is you're losing biodiversity, you're losing the habitat, so you're going to lose habitat for animals to use. Uh, not only that, plants that are in there, we may discover later, may have that have some compound that it's useful for treating um, some kind of thing, maybe uh, some disease in humans, maybe cancer someday. Uh, and we would never know because you wiped out a species you didn't even, weren't even able to study. Uh, and so... Uh, Deforestation also causes desertification. That means you have a transition because of the loss of trees, which actually promotes rainfall, ends up losing the rainfall. Then you end up with deserts now because you don't get the rainfall you used to. You're going to have a loss of soils and nutrients. We saw that in the image before. Uh, you're going to have... Um, um, water pollution because of the silt that's just clouding the water and you're also going to throw a lot of nutrients out there so you could get eutrophication problems. You're going to disrupt the water cycle. 
especially in rainforest as an example, uh, without that vegetation there, that vegetation actually uh, helps part of that water cycle because of uh, evapotranspiration. And transpiration was something we talked about in uh, plant chapters. Uh, water is taken up through the roots and then leaves the leaves uh, through transpiration. And then that enters the atmosphere and then the warm air moves it up and then it rains back down again. But you don't have uh, the vegetation there to help complete that part of the cycle. You lose, uh, you can lose some of that rain. Uh, deforestation can also uh, result in acid rain because of slash and burn techniques, right? So if you're burning, if you burn wood, you're going to generate um, some uh, small amounts of sulfur oxides and uh, nitrogen oxides from the high temperatures, and that creates acid rain. Uh, another problem uh, could be zoonotic diseases. Zoonotic diseases are diseases that are transferred from animal to um, uh from animal to animal and potentially uh, into a human population. So um, COVID is one of them we're dealing with right now, and it's viral, right? Um, so contagious diseases, as we fragment forests and we go and encroach in habitats that uh, we once never uh, were around, you start exposing yourself to animals that potentially have viruses that can jump into us. Uh, there's a close enough connection to our species for that to occur. HIV is an example of one that uh, mutated from a simian uh, form that affected apes, uh, and it was it's called SIV, and HIV is the mutated form that jumped into humans. Nipah virus from bats, pigs in Malaysia, uh, swine flu in the, two, uh, the 2009. Uh, these are, uh, when we went over viruses, those are examples. And then Lyme disease, um, from disrupting forest ecosystems here in the United States, Lyme disease is caused by uh, uh, a tick vector that would transmit a bacteria that causes Lyme disease. And so how can that occur? Well, uh, it has to do with when you're fragmenting forests and uh, the relative densities of the vectors that transmit these uh, diseases, including ticks and the mammals that they live on. And so you can see here, if you have a normal continuous forest here, uh, and you have a um, rodents like, uh, say, uh, uh, some sort of a rodent that has these ticks on there, uh, the level of uh, ticks on these rodents that are carrying um, uh, uh, ticks that have the bacteria that causes Lyme disease, the tick is going to bite you and then give you the bacteria, right? And it picks it up from uh, um, uh, a rodent that might be carrying it. So when you have lower densities in a greater forested area, uh, the amount of, uh, of ticks that are carrying the, the Lyme disease bacteria, which is, uh, this is a scientific name for it, Borrelia, um, Burgdorferi. And so when you start to fragment, we cut it in there and we start building uh, near these forested areas, you may have higher densities of these rodents and the ticks are picking up because the ticks go through, uh, they shed. Remember, they're ectosocellans, they're arthropods, they shed. And when they do, they drop off of one host, one uh, rodent or some animal. And then once they've shed, they go and they grab onto another one. And so uh, they may be carrying that bacteria and they're transmitting it uh, to these uh, higher density rodents in there. And so you can see in fragmented areas, the red area shows the infected ticks is much more than in continuous. Uh, and that's just uh, one example, but you go and you fragment habitats, you're exposing yourself uh, to uh, new areas where there may be certain bacteria or viruses that are just part of that area, endemic to that region, and now you're going and you're coming in contact with it. So it can cause uh, uh, increase in, in human diseases. Uh, and then uh, another, uh, so we're talking about fragmentation. Now we move on to over-exploitation. You can over, over, cutting down forests is over-exploiting uh, as well, right? So the, the habitat itself. Uh, and then when it comes to fisheries, uh, the areas where we go to fish uh, for food, for uh, that part of our food economy, um, they can get overfished. So that's overexploitation of a resource. Uh, poaching as well. Poaching is when you overhunt, like when uh, they're overhunting, um, poaching animals out in areas. Uh, 
um, for whatever, whether it's for bush meat or or for trophies or, or, or for ivory from elephant tusks. Uh, all of these are over-exploitation, and what's over-exploiting about it is that you are harvesting, uh, whether it's legal or illegal, you're harvesting more uh, animals from that population than they're capable of replacing themselves with. And so what happens is populations drop to levels that they may never recover from. Uh, and that could send them off into becoming endangered and potential extinction. Uh, so we've overfished a lot of the areas normally fished. I, met, I mentioned the George's Bank or George's, George's Bank here off of uh, the northeast out here. So there is uh, uh, some of our northeastern states, Vermont, uh, New Hampshire, um, Maine. And this is the part of the continental shelf out there, the George's Bank. And this is where it was a lot of great fishing for a while. Uh, and so um, you tend to see here uh, that this ecosystem has a loss in biomass. And you saw from 1978 to 2006, if you start, uh, if you were recording just how much fish you were taking, and you call that the biomass of the fish, you see this significant drop uh, in the thousands of metric tons. And why is it dropping? Because the fish are simply not there. Right? So, uh, and then you have aquaculture. So aquaculture... Uh, is where you're like farming fish. And in some cases, you're going to do this uh, in, a, in a coastal area just right up on the shore area. And you have these massive pools or ponds where you're growing shrimp or fish or whatever. And then you're feeding them wild caught fish, small fish that are normally prey for larger fish. So you go out and you catch all of these small fish species and then you grind them up and use them as meal to feed that fish well you're messing up the ocean ecosystem already. And then these aquacultures do generate a lot of fish waste from their excrement. The fish are like any other living thing. They're releasing waste product. And where do you, where do you send it? You send it out to the water, and now you're causing eutrophication uh, and pollution of the, of the coastal area. Uh, overall. Uh, and so the aquaculture also involves clearing out uh, normal habitats that would normally occur there, like mangrove swamps, uh, to produce that. And these mangroves are important uh, parts of estuaries. Uh, and not only that, uh, some of these provide protection against tropical storms when they come in, hurricanes against storm surges, because the hurricanes usually bring in uh, a really large surge of water that comes in and then goes way inland uh, beyond there. So uh, pollution of the oceans is another one. Uh, you probably heard of these plastic islands where a bunch of plastic is accumulating and this is being eaten by animals and uh, poisoning animals, choking animals, uh, and just generally having microplastics even enter food, uh, food webs. Uh, so you're getting accumulation of plastics uh, within our tissues, even humans as well. Uh, and uh, some of these uh, pollutants uh, are toxic chemicals. They've biopsied or taken samples of living killer whales, for example, and have found high levels of pesticides in there, uh, flame retardant chemicals that they put in, uh, um, in materials that we use here normally. And then destruction of coastal ecosystems. We talked about estuaries already. I mentioned them briefly just, just a minute ago here. Uh, estuaries, they're subject to eutrophication. I mentioned the dead zones earlier, right, uh, uh, from the runoff. Uh, and then you're going to destroy marshes for development, and it could be for aquaculture. Uh, it could be for development of nice hotels or whatever on a barrier island, like here at South Barrier Island or, or anywhere else where you develop along the coast. And that creates damage to these normal natural systems that provided some levels of protection. They provided habitat for, for uh, things that live along the coastline. They provided, uh, and those things are connected to the estuaries of the fish that live in there. So all of these connections now are being disrupted uh, from um, the destruction of these ecosystems from some form of development or another. Um, Hurricane Katrina was a big one that caused quite a bit of damage and uh, I think it was around 2005 I gotta go back and look at the year 
Uh, but that caused a lot of people to have to move. And had some of those marshes normally been there and barrier islands that were off the coast there and the marshes there, the amount of damage that the storm surge could have done from Katrina might have been lower. Now, there was a lot of heavy winds during that hurricane, but uh, storm surges do a lot of more damage as well. Uh, the area is overall sunk in to begin with, uh, and uh, uh, some areas in, uh, that are out there are actually below sea level, but damaging ecosystems can create uh, issues when tropical storms come in. And then we have uh, the problem with ozone, uh, and ozone is found in the stratosphere. The lower level of the atmosphere is the troposphere, where we find uh, life. Uh, and then you go up, uh, and the next layer of the atmosphere is the stratosphere. So stratos stratospheric ozone is important because it blocks damaging ultraviolet light. Ultraviolet light can damage DNA and other biomolecules, uh, just disrupting. And so there's large, uh, thin uh, area. It's not a, a big, it's not a blank hole with no ozone, but it's very thin uh, area. Uh, over Antarctica, so it's in the southern hemisphere, and sometimes that whole shifts. Uh, uh, so it may be over Australia or so uh, during certain times of the year. But overall, the amount of concentration of ozone has uh, decreased in that area. And you can see tracking the size of this hole here since 1979. There is a period around 1995 with missing data because satellites that were measuring this uh, broke down. But you can see here, this is tracking the average size of that hole there of thin to ozone. Um, and it's remained uh, somewhat stable over time. And the culprit has been some industrial chemicals um, that are related to propellants they use in the cans, uh, refrigerants used for refrigerators, air conditions, and so on. Uh, so, uh, over the United States uh, itself, ozone concentration has been reduced by 4%. And I was just, I remember when I was a kid, I don't feel like I got uh, burned as much as I do now. Now I go out to this, in, uh, during uh, even the early morning hours in summertime, and I feel like my lips are frying and my skin is frying. And just, it, it's just not for me. Uh, it's just not like it used to be. Um, and so, the, again, the ozone is important. Uh, and to be clear that uh, as you look at the percent drop in ozone, the, thic the thickness of the layer of ozone, a 1% drop of ozone is connected to a 6% increase in skin cancer. It is also uh, damaging to the development of amphibian eggs, which are going to be exposed there in shallow water. Uh, and... The culprit here, again, is industrial chemicals. They, they just call CFCs, which stands for chlorofluorocarbons. The very interesting thing about chlorofluorocarbons, they're, car they're organic molecules that have chlorine and fluorine on them. And chlorine and fluorine, these are halogens. They're in the second to the last column of the periodic table. Um, these compounds are very stable here at the surface. And so that's why they're used as propellants. So if I want to use them in a can, uh, a spray can that's under pressure, the propellant is the, is the CFC. And the reason you use it is because it's very stable. It's not going to react with anything else you're trying to get out of the can, right? So you're trying to get out some liquid out of the can, and use it makes a nice propellant. They're also used for coolants uh, because uh, of their properties. Uh, they absorb heat, and they can move heat out of the building and for air conditioning. Uh, and they're very stable for that need. The problem is, is when these things leak out, they're very stable and they have a long environmental life and they end up floating up in the atmosphere. And when they get up into the area of the stratosphere, they're going to be nailed with more intense ultraviolet. And it's that ultraviolet that causes these compounds that are normally stable here to break apart. And when they break apart, they're going to free up radical chlorine, which is very reactive, and fluorine. And at those... Uh, unstable chlorine atoms react with the ozone and just start depleting the ozone molecules in the atmosphere. And so while these CFCs have been phased out in many countries, they are still being used here and there, and there's still some in the atmosphere that were released years ago. These molecules are still making their way up and are still creating some damage. So some of the good news is that 
the ozone levels have remained relatively stable. If we lose that ozone layer, life on the surface of the planet is just not going to be uh, possible, right? So remember that ozone blocks 95% of the ultraviolet. 95%, that means 5% makes it through from the sun. And you still get a sunburn. Imagine if 10% made it through that. It's, it's going to be damaging enough. So without ozone, life on the surface would not be possible. So this section here covers uh, human impacts on the biosphere, specifically uh, talking about climate change. So that's uh, another big issue affecting life on the planet and uh, our economies and so on. So here, your first objective is to explain the link between atmospheric carbon dioxide, CO2, and global warming. And then describe the consequences of global warming on ecosystems and human health. So carbon dioxide and other gases um, in the atmosphere actually uh, absorb uh, radiant energy and, and then keep that energy that uh, in the atmosphere. Uh, and that overall helps maintain the, the temperature, the average global temperature of around 25 degrees Celsius. Uh, on average, there's cooler places, warmer places. Uh, 21, 22 degrees is about room temperatures in the 70s, right? So uh, average for the whole globe, right? So these are these are carbon dioxide and these other gases are called greenhouse gases because they act like a greenhouse and that they keep um, heat energy in the atmosphere. Uh, human activities, though, are changing the composition of the atmosphere. One of the ways we're changing it is we're increasing the levels of CO2 due to our activities, specifically burning fossil fuels, uh, and we're also releasing other gases into the atmosphere that also serve as greenhouse gases. So uh, here you have a map of 2016. The surface temperatures uh, are looked at in uh, the Celsius scale, the centigrade scale. Every degree Fahrenheit we're used to, every degree Celsius is almost two degrees Fahrenheit. So the Celsius uh, centigrade degree is actually a bigger unit. So one unit change is actually uh, more than a degree change in the Fahrenheit scale. So one degree change in uh, Celsius is almost two degrees change in Fahrenheit. So this is in the Celsius scale. And this is in 2016, and the scale down here with the color coding shows the anomaly, which means that it is different than what a baseline average would be. And so you can see in the real dark red, that's between 3 and 5.9 anomaly positive, so that means higher than normal. And you can see that most of the temperature anomalies are uh, not in this range here. They're all yellow uh, to orange to reds. So in this 2016 overall globally, the average annual temperature was higher than what's considered normal. So, uh, and this has been a trend uh, for many, many years now where we're seeing this increase in temperature. Over here you see uh, over approximately uh, 100 years, this is a Fahrenheit change. Uh, in this century, uh, and you can see again, we're in the red area, so overall we're seeing an increase in the temperatures just there in the United States. So um, there are several different assumptions in these models, uh, but we do know CO2 is increasing in the atmosphere. We can actually track it to fossil fuels uh, based on uh, certain understanding of the different types of carbon you find. Uh, don't have time to get into those uh, the foundations of how you can trace the source of carbon. Uh, but based on uh, model simulations, the human climate is very complex to predict, but we know if you increase uh, carbon dioxide levels, and there's a lot of other factors that are at play here, but generally you see an increase in carbon dioxide, you know it's going to trap more uh, radiant energy, it's going to trap more heat in the atmosphere. So all of the models do show an increase. The amount of increase is going to vary depending on the assumptions of the model, but overall we can predict there's going to be an increase in global temperatures. Uh, some countries are going to benefit from these changes, but others are going to have, be negatively impacted overall. Uh, maybe um, hard to predict that's going to be a, a balancing there. 
So here you see uh, just from 1960 to 2016, four years ago, you can see the levels of carbon dioxide concentration in parts per million in the atmosphere. Back in 1960, it was below 320 parts per million. And today, we've passed and overshot what many uh, climate scientists believe should be a level that we should have gone past. Uh, and um, this has to do with a large climate system. Uh, and this large system uh, takes a long time uh, to absorb changes and then output uh, different uh, scenarios. So uh, a lot of this carbon dioxide that we're putting in the atmosphere today is going to guarantee to trap more heat in the, in, the, in, the, in the distant future because of this lag time in the system. Uh, but you can see corresponding to the annual global temperature anomalies. So anomalies are different than uh, what would be expected uh, uh, overall. So you can see that while you have ups and downs due to multiple factors here, these are average global temperatures, but overall the trend is matching the increase in carbon dioxide. Uh, so there is a relationship between the two. And overall we see that uh, we are increasing above uh, an average temperature of some baseline temperature, which would be about right here the average global temperature. So let's say the average global temperatures were uh, 22 degrees or so, or 23 degrees Celsius. And so uh, if you have a 0.9 anomaly, that means you're at uh, overall global average of, uh, you've gone from 22 to 22.9. This is just, there's just about a degree difference. Remember, the Celsius scale is different than the Fahrenheit scale. It's a larger unit. And we're talking about overall global average change. Uh, any degree change in there is a lot of energy that has had to have been absorbed by the Earth to uh, change this. So you're talking about lots and lots of energy, which can create more intense weather patterns. So that, that part is missed by, by folks who don't understand the idea of the relation between energy and temperature and what kind of effects that can have on global uh, weather and climate patterns uh, overall. So um, how does CO2 affect temperature? Well, it's going to absorb electromagnetic energy, which is also called radiant energy. It's almost redundant to say electromagnetic radiant energy. The specific energy that it does absorb is infrared. Okay. And it's absorbed by the bonds in the carbon dioxide. So if we look at a typical carbon dioxide molecule, the, those bonds that are there, this is what it looks like. And that infrared gets absorbed by those bonds. And that causes the bonds to stretch and bend. And that bending is due to the absorption of that energy. So the molecule is out of shape. And when it returns to its normal shape, it then re-radiates infrared. It re-radiates energy that it absorbs. So here it's absorbing. And it re-radiates, and this energy goes to another carbon dioxide molecule. And then its bonds can absorb that energy. So it goes and gets absorbed there. So what's happening here is this infrared's bouncing back and forth between the CO2 molecules. And the more there are there, the more of this energy is going to be bouncing around instead of being radiated back out into space. Right? So the more of these greenhouse gases, the more energy is going to be trapped, the higher the temperature changes are going to get. Okay, so uh, basically, uh, Earth maintains a relatively stable temperature because the amount of energy absorbed is being bounced by the amount of energy being given off back into space. But if you disrupt those things that create that balance overall by adding more greenhouse gases, you're disrupting that balance, and now you're gaining more energy than you're radiating out, and that causes increase in temperature. So um, the, the basic idea that I discussed, uh, I've already mentioned uh, infrared is uh, the energy that's being absorbed and re-radiated between these uh, uh, greenhouse gases. This is a principle called greenhouse theory, okay? Uh, and it's well supported. This is a, it's a theory, nothing is proven, but this is the explanation for how it goes. Uh, you can measure, repeatedly measure that these gases absorb uh, energy, 
and hold it. You can do it in an, uh, in an aquarium in a, in a high school lab. You can actually measure this absorption very easily with a thermometer. You know it happens, and the explanation is the explanation I gave you with those bonds. The bonds uh, absorb the energy, distort in their shape, then go back and then re-radiate the energy, and then the next molecule captures it, and so on. So bouncing back and forth, keeping that energy up. Much like gas, uh, the glass in a car or a greenhouse keeps uh, the temperature inside warm because it's uh, maintaining the infrared energy in there. So uh, there are other greenhouse gases like methanes and some uh, other gases that are capable of trapping heat. And uh, some are actually more potent at trapping heat. Uh, methane is 20 times, has 20 times greater uh, strength at uh, trapping heat than CO2 does. And methane uh, is released by a number of uh, factors, including human activity. Uh, some of the newer technologies that they're using to uh, tap into fossil fuels underground, uh, including fracking, are being shown to release uh, lots of methane gas. Methane is part of the of the uh, of the uh, of the gases and the oil that they're looking for. There's different uh, uh, types of gases that are there. Uh, some are liquid, some are gases uh, at these temperatures. One of them is methane. It's there on the top of the oil supply. So when they tap in there, it can be released. Uh, and so you're, you're seeing the evidence is showing us that you're increasing that from that. Uh, methane is also naturally produced by methanogens in anaerobic soils where there's not a lot of oxygen. Uh, under permafrost, you have bacteria that have broken down organic mo molecules and made methane from these in the absence of oxygen. And so there's a concern as we begin to thaw the thermal frost out in the tundra that that may release lots more methane and cause uh, a significant increase in greenhouse uh, gas absorption. Uh, and it could have runaway warming is, is a very real scenario that uh, we hope doesn't happen. Uh, so um, that can cause large uh, changes in, in the global temperatures and it's sort of a positive feedback. You warm, you melt ice, that releases the, the methane from underneath and so it's an issue. So here's a picture of uh, Mount Kilimanjaro, uh, which I think is in Africa. Uh, not sure the exact uh, geography there, uh, but it's a uh, mountain there. And you can see the glacier, which is uh, thick sheets of ice that are formed up there on the top. And this picture was taken in 1970. This other picture here is taken in about year 2014 or so. And you can see that what used to be a glacier here has receded significantly due to uh, loss, uh, increase in temperature. So what are ecosystem effects from uh, global warming and more correctly climate change associated with the warming temperatures? Uh, this is going to affect ecosystems. It's, uh, climate has always changed historically. The concern here is the rate at which climate is changing. The earth is very, very old. You might recall, recall from our um, second chapter this summer session uh, or this uh, during the semester session. Uh, and uh, the Earth has always been going through changes. And we've had cooler periods and warmer periods. The thing is that these changes have occurred over hundreds of thousands to about millions of years, not over a span of a few hundred years because of, of uh, you know, these new technologies that are using fossil fuels. So uh, what can occur when you have warming? You're going to have shift in geographic ranges. So you may see plants starting to show up further north as the planet warms. It's not as cold as it used to get. You're going to see changes in patterns of migration, patterns of flowering among plants, insect patterns, uh, their annual cycles, uh, amphibians, uh, breeding cycles, breeding periods. Um, uh, so uh, fruit fly populations, uh, changes in those populations can occur. Uh, coral reefs, have been shown to be sensitive to temperature changes. So you get bleaching, and bleaching is just a way of saying the corals are dying uh, from those reefs. Um, and how the ability for these populations to adapt is uncertain, especially for case-selected species, which we learned about in population ecology chapter. The rate of war the concern here is the rate of warming is is actually 
relatively fast because of the changes that are occurring in the atmosphere or at a relatively faster time scale than any other time in which climate has changed. So the, the question is, will there be enough time for many of the species to adapt to these quick changes? And so we might affect, we see effect on biodiversity as a concern. Um, we might see natural areas no longer covering whole landscapes because of changes in climate. Uh, species shift uh, to higher altitudes and they may reach the very limit because they're, they're sensitive to warm temperatures and they need to move further up uh, uh, the mountain where it's cooler. Uh, and we could see species uh, habitats disappearing entirely. And if the species habitat disappears, then the species disappears with it. Uh, here's an example of a butterfly in Great Britain, which is uh, a group of islands uh, out there. And so you see uh, the species is, uh, I'm not really sure how you pronounce the, the uh, scientific name, but there's the, the, the genus and the specific epithet. And in the 19, from 1970 to 1997, we see a change in the geographic distribution to further north. So this is north on the on the map here for this island, uh, for Great Britain. And you can see that the former range or distribution from 1915 to 1939 is in the black areas down here further south. So what is warming done is potentially a lot for an expansion of the range further north uh, for this species of butterfly. Possible effects on human population are very real, rising sea levels. A lot of populations live along the coast. So you're talking about hundreds of millions of people becoming environmental refugees, having to move uh, away from the coastline. Uh, so uh, entire islands could go underwater. We've already seen some, uh, some of that occur in smaller islands in certain places globally. Uh, the frequency and severity of, uh, of weather events right so whether what you get right so you're going to get you can get a drier dries more drought more hurricanes cold even i paradoxically you get colder colds uh you can even get more snow because a warmer atmosphere holds more water higher air temperature holds more water but when you get up to a certain level up there you can still get snow because that uh, it's cooler up there, cool enough to produce snow, and so you get more snow even though it's due to warmer temperatures, greater more heat waves, more extreme weather events is a concern. We already seen extreme heat waves that have been occurring uh, more and more frequently. Effects on agriculture, ability to grow food. Uh, we can see that uh, more CO2, which is what plants take in, right, for photosynthesis, that can increase the growth of some crops, not at all. So some positive effects here. Uh, increase in pollen production with the greater temperatures, right, and more CO2. That can cause an effect on human population because more allergy. Uh, more droughts in some reason, in some regions, so you won't be able to grow crops where you normally grew them. Uh, and then a decrease in crop production in tropical areas, perhaps due to changes in rain patterns or it's too hot for uh, certain crops to grow. Uh, human health, uh, if you get uh, more rainstorms, you're going to get more flooding. And that means uh, uh, when you get a lot of flooding, even in developed areas, you can have water, drinking water become unsafe, get contaminated because of overflowing sewers and other things. And so you get outbreaks of cholera and uh, other epidemics from uh, the lack of uh, normally functioning sanitation systems. Tropical diseases can invade more northern countries. We already have problems with certain tropical diseases here, dengue fever, uh, malaria. These types of diseases can move further north. Uh, overall, there's uh, already cases of dengue fever with mosquitoes from uh, hurricanes. So. These diseases become endemic. That means they're now naturally occurring here, whereas they were further south. So uh, these are real issues to be concerned about.